God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Our Father's truth, as we state it, does go marching on. His truth that brings you peace of mind, that brings you to a place and a level of life itself in these final days that you can comprehend, that you can cope that you can have that commodity, peace of mind. Let us approach his throne and thank him for it. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the written word. We thank you, Father, for the truth. Father, help us understand this subject that we'll be studying in these next two le lectures. We ask it in the precious name of Yahshua, Jesus the Christ. Amen. We're going to do a little research and study on the deadly wound. Inasmuch as the deadly wound will be the next, I would assume, major prophetic thing to come to pass, then let us try to better understand what is involved with it. Now, number one, you must understand that there are two beasts written and recorded in the book of Revelation, that is to say the 13th chapter, that system that would take over in the final days. Now, to understand what this deadly wound is and how it applies, we're going to go all the way this time. We're even going to go for geographics, uh, locations, as to where this wound would take place. But first, let's understand that in a sense there must be two woundings. We must wound the first beast, which is the political system, and that will be basically covered in the next lecture. But there must also be a wounding of the beast, uh, which is the Antichrist. Uh, Let's understand what the wound is, how it applies, and what you must do to apply it. So with that thought in mind, let's cover chapter 13 in the book of Revelation, verses 1 through 3, beginning with 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea. Sea is water, and water in the book of Revelation is symbolic of people. I stood and I looked at the people of the world, and I saw a beast rise out of those people, that sea having seven heads and ten horns. And we know that this is from seven dominions of the world, and it is ten men or women that, and women that rise from. And upon his horns ten crowns, crowns meaning they will rule in a one-world system, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Blasphemy is what? That identifies it. It is to blaspheme the truth of God, his son, Yahshua, Jesus the Christ. In other words, it is a one-world system that will stand against that that you know as to be true Christianity, that is to say, followers of Christ and his teachings. Uh, it will be worldwide. Now, this particular beast that rose from this water is not an entity. By that I mean it is not an individual. It has many heads, meaning it's not some monster. God doesn't deal in comic books or fictitious characters. He deals in reality. It is symbolism whereby you can understand better what he's saying. He's saying it is a political system made up from the seven continents or the seven dominions of this world to blaspheme or teach a, or lead away from the true God. Verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard in Daniel, the uh, uh, this is a pantha, which has spots. Their spots are not as our spots. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. In other words, it used the bear to do its traveling or mobility or to put into effect. We know what the bear nation is in the last days. It is Russia. All right. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion. That's unusual, isn't it? Because who is... In Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, the Lion of Judah, uh, the Lion of uh, Judah is given the right to open the seal, which was Jesus Christ, of course. Judah is always thought of as the Lion. Well, the, the um, uh, Lion of Judah, of course, is Jesus Christ. This meaning that the very Christian people that follow him will be the mouth, uh, understand, the mouth that brings this into reality. It uses the mobility of Russia, yes, but our own people. If it were not for the Christians, the Kenites could not have a nation today. It is the Christians that sponsor it, uh, promote it, propagate it, uh, and finance it. Uh, okay, continuing in his seat and great, I'm sorry, continuing back following Lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. 
Of course, the dragon is the role Satan plays as the Antichrist, the false Christ presence will be so strong that he will allow this one world system to take effect. This is why it is written, when they cry, peace, 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 there shall be no peace. For there's only one Prince of Peace, and that is Yahshua, Jesus the Christ. Uh, okay, let's continue verse 3. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Now, did it say part of the world did? No, it says all the world wonders after the beast. This means that, what was the beast again? It's a one world political system. The dragon, that is the Antichrist, healed simply by his appearance, people thinking it is the true Messiah, in the whole world. This is that apostasy we were talking about, the falling away from the truth. But now we must be more specific. In a, we are in that hour, so we must be more specific in understanding this wound uh, to this political system. How does it take place? We must look further ahead, if you would, even to the wounding of the Antichrist. Uh, for he shall be wounded, and we're taught, speaking, I hope you can gather, in a political and spiritual vein, not actually blood running down the street. It is deception, babble, and confusion that is upon the people. So how do you wound a, a lie? By correcting it with the truth. All right, let's, let's, first of all, we must give credit where credit is due. Uh, and that credit must, of course, go to the Father. You remember the Song of Moses. If you, ha if you don't understand the Song of Moses, Reve Revelation chapter 15 states that this is the song that all those that overcome this system and the beast will be singing. What are some of the words of that Song of Moses? Let us turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. And let's understand who it is, first of all, that controls the wounding. This is in the Song of Moses that the overcomers shall be singing. So therefore, even though it is in the Old Testament, it certainly will apply to the first day of the millennium. It applies now, but what I mean, it will still be very active, for these are the words that will be coming from the elect's mouth. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39, and we read, See now that I, this is the Father, Yahweh speaking, even I am He. Or you could say, I and I alone am He, and there is no God with me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. So number one, the point I want you to get from this is don't think it's the dragon that heals the wound. It could, he could not accept that the Father allow it. It's truly God himself that is in control all the time. That's why you can count on him. All right? Let's, let's continue on verse 40. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. In other words, all I have to do is lift my hand up and say, I live forever and I have eternity. I am Yahweh. All right? 41. For I whet my glittering sword and mine hand take hold on judgment. What is judgment? That's the last day of this age, beloved. Judgment day, you've heard of it. I will render vengeance to my enemies. Did he say he wanted you to do it? I believe he says, I will render vengeance uh, to mine enemies and will reward them that hate uh, me. Verse 42, I will make mine arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning, underline it, from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. So we see that there are more than just one instant, such as Haman, Gog, and Armageddon. There will be a beginning to this, and this should be no mystery to you. In other words, this is your part. Did Jesus not say, I come to the world not to bring peace but a fire, and how happy I will be if I find it already kindled? His fire is the truth. God is a consuming fire. You're supposed to have that truth already established and started in that direction when he returns. 
But there's no way you can do that if you don't know what you're supposed to do. Well, how do you create the wound? And that's what I hope to show through these two lectures, is how that is accomplished. We had a shining example of this set forth by David. Who is David? David the king. David, that it was promised through his seed, would come that lion of Judah that had the right to open those five, seven seals to the truth. He set forth an example of slaying a beast. Don't you think we should take the time in the opportunity and the privilege to understand what is written for you in the slaying of Goliath? For you must be a giant slayer also in a spiritual sense. Turn with me to the first Samuel. First Samuel chapter 17. And those of you in the tape audience that have Vulgate, you would find this would be First Kings chapter 17. I believe it would be chapter 17. Okay, but in your King James it is First Samuel chapter 17. Okay, let's, let's remember that David, uh, first of all, here is Saul, the king of Israel. He has an army at bay, or perhaps it might be better stated they had him at bay. It is the Philistines, all right, or the Philistines in part. And these great warriors of Israel stand there and quake because on this mountain appeared a giant that was, according to some people, uh, anywhere from 10 to 14 feet tall. I figure about 13 feet would be more accurate. His armor alone weighed approximately 237 pounds. His arrow, his shaft, was uh, his spear was 23 feet long, weighing 36 pounds. What an awesome figure this must have made. And this one, Goliath, had come up on this mountain and taunted uh, the troops. Uh, and David, the sheep herder, did you hear what I said? The sheep herder. He that cared for the sheep, the shepherd. Does that, do you, are we cluing in now? The shepherd, who is the true shepherd? Christ, of course. David was a tender of the sheep. Who are the sheep? You. The children of Israel are the sheep. Okay, so he can't, his father told him, take uh, certain amounts of food to your brothers that are in the army of Saul. And this David then comes upon this scene of the best of Israel being mocked and taunted uh, by this, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going, the weight of his was 273 pounds, his armor and his weapons. But David comes upon this scene, let's take it in verse 22 if we may. And David, he's just arriving with this food for his brothers in the army. Verse 22 of chapter 17, 1 Samuel. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage, and he ran into the army, and he came, and he saluted his brethren. No doubt he was very happy to see them. 23. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath. Now, I want you to underline in your mind that word Gath. You're going to need it in the next lecture. And it means in the Hebrew tongue, wine press but it's also a geographical location. Goliath, which means splendid, uh, by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and he spake according to the same words, and David heard them. In other words, he was standing there taunting, let one of you come forth and conquer me, and the rest uh, surrender, and so forth. 24, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him. They were frightened, uh, and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with, the great, with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Boy, that would be quite a promise, wouldn't it? Really something to look forward to. Don't ever believe for a moment this is the prize that David wanted. All right? First of all, clear that in your mind. He, he wanted the will of God. Verse 26, And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach for Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? In other words, he's saying, in a way, what does it matter? This man is defying the army of the living God. 
And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. In verse 28, David goes up to his older brother. And Eliab, this Eliab means El is my father, or God is my father. His eldest brother heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep? Underline it in your mind. He left the sheep in the wilderness. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. No doubt his older brother, he loved David very much, but no doubt he was ashamed that this wisp of a kid, for he was a lad and a small lad, could, had, could see his own elder brother have to back away from this uncircumcised Philistine that was making these taunts against our Heavenly Father. Blaspheming the true God. You're going to see it soon, beloved. You're going to see a giant come forth. Uh, and he's going to be blaspheming Christ that died on the cross. You're going to hear it. It will be so blasphemous that he will be claiming to be Christ. Claiming to be God. He's going to stand on the mountain and your people are going to sh shake uh, they're going to believe him. They're going to receive a wound themselves, if you would. But little David says this, uh, Beloved, remember the sheep. Always remember the sheep. 29, And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Really what this breaks down in the Hebrew or can be is, is, There is a cause here. You should have done something. I will. That's what David said, all right? 30, and he turned from him toward another, and he spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. 31. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. No doubt pretty soon it got under their skin. They were all ashamed. They all wanted to take on this giant. And here this wisp of a lad is running around, you know, causing this. So it finally got to Saul, the back word back to him. 32. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Don't be afraid of that giant. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. I'll do it. You know, but you must remember what David had. All right? We'll find out very shortly. 32, 3. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. He's experienced. He's tough. He's big. He has 273 pounds of armor, and what are you? 34, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And you can learn a great deal from keeping sheep, beloved, in a spiritual sense. And I'm talking about God's sheep, his children. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. Ooh, ooh, wait, 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 wait. A bear and a lion? Did we not read that in connection with another beast that was receiving a deadly wound? I believe we did. It moved with the power of the feet of the bear. As I told you, this Kathy was mentioning this this weekend. It's, it's an intriguing thought. For we see that this lad, this little shepherd, has already conquered uh, the bear and the lion. Now let us continue. Uh, remember, it had taken a lamb, a little one, deceived it from the flock. I speak both literally and spiritually. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. Uh, and when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard uh, and smote him and slew him. You see? Now stop and think about that. I don't imagine any of these others in this army of Israel had accomplished quite this. You see, the whole need of it is he was protecting the lamb. 36, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Note he didn't say the armies of Israel, the armies of the living God. He's doing this in God's name. For you see, there is no power of this magnitude in, in, in any other name. Verse 37. And David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, 
he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Beloved, I want to assure you that this bare one world system, this bare nation, and the lion, the lion was what? The lion are the followers of the lion of Judah, which is Christ, which means Christians. It is their mouth uh, that shall deceive and cause the deception because of the dragon, the false Christ, the Antichrist. They will believe it is Christ. They do not expect a, a false Christ to even appear, much less. God shall deliver you out of their hand. The same as he delivered David uh, out of this lion and this bear. You don't have to worry about those things. Some sites say, well, boy, that man talks like, you know, like he's lost a brick off the, 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 the stack or something, you know. He's talking about Russia and all those nations. Yes, I am. For you see, there is only one nation, and that is true Israel. And do you know what makes up true Israel? God's elect. And every nation shall join themselves to that nation, or they shall cease to be a nation. We have the victory. We're not playing games. If you want to get in real politics, get in your father's political camp. For we're going to win. We already have the victory. But you have to declare it. That's what David did. He said, I'll take him on. And I imagine to that lad, that that giant, as he looked up, he was probably looked larger than 13 feet tall. Okay? So don't be afraid of this world. Your father controls it. Did we not read in Deuteronomy? He says, I wound, I heal, I control. And you are the one that starts the beginning. Okay? Verse 38. And Saul armed David with his armor. Now you listen close. And he put an helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. Now, you know this is not the gospel armor, beloved. You know there's only one armor we use. So he put this, no doubt that poor boy was almost pushed through the floor with the weight uh, of that king's armor, you see. Okay? And David girded his sword upon his armor and he essayed. You, he was, essayed means he tested it. He looked the situation over and thought about it like you would test gold, I say it, to see what was in it. And he knew this wasn't going to work. You know, it didn't take much for a sheep herder to know that he wasn't going to be able to much less carry that stuff, much less use it. All right? So use common sense. All right? For he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. He knew what he had to take to have this victory. Okay? Verse 40. And he took his staff in his hand, his shepherd's rod, and he chose him five, uh, five being the number of grace, smooth stones out of the brook, the water of life, of course, beloved, and put them in a shepherd's bag. He was uh, the shepherd of the, of the sheep, the children, symbolic of that to come, which he had, even in a script. That script means a purse, all right? And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Now, I want you to know this made quite a picture, no doubt, as this young lad went down and he crossed that brook and began to climb the mountain towards that 13-foot-tall giant. Uh, okay? And the Philistine came on, and he drew nigh unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. Well, there's two of them. His old shield's so heavy, he's even got a... A peon to carry it along there. 42. And when the Philistine looked about, he saw David. He disdained him. He, did, he hated him. For he was but a, a, a youth and ruddy and a, a fair countenance. He was a fair boy. No doubt he was blonde or very light complected. Right? 43. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. His gods, of course, were Dagon and Baal and Satan, even if you would. Uh, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you something. That would intimidate most people. It really would. To see that man standing up there and cursing you and shouting, it would intimidate a lot of people. But you know why it didn't intimidate David? You're going to find out in a minute. David knew what he was armed with. He wasn't one wit worried. 44. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, 
and to the beast of the field. And then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. Now you listen to me real close, beloved. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. That's what I come with. You can have your sword, your bucklers, your shields. I come in the name of the living God. 46. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand. Did David expect to do it? No. Think about it. This day God will give you into me, big boy. But he wasn't worried about it. Um, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beast of the earth. For what purpose? Shapen up, sharpen up for me, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Now, you either believe it or you don't, beloved. You know, I made a statement a while ago. He's talking about Russia. He's talking about the world. And this little family of the elect is going to do something. You better believe it. Through God, through our Father, we have the victory. Now, I'm sure that this young lad, it would sound, it would be a joke, would it not, you know, in modern day times to most people? But he did it, too. For it was not he that accomplished it, but the Heavenly Father. Now, listen closely. 47. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. Did you hear me? The Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. Now, if you ever remember anything, beloved, remember that. And he will give you unto our hands. Oh, what a lesson Israel could learn. But we have some two-gun toters that are show their own ignorance when they say, we're going to overcome the world. We've got to get 20 million together. A big All you need is God. You go to putting 20 million together, and if there's not one smart man in the whole bunch, how are you going to have the victory? You can't, for there isn't. There, you see, the reason I say there's not a smart man in the bunch is they can't read this. And you know, many children should be able to read the fact that the Lord doesn't use a sword or a spear. He uses wisdom. You see. Okay. Israel listen and Israel learn if you want the victory. Think of that boy on that ridge. You know, it takes only you and the Lord. That's all. It doesn't take a committee. 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, and David hastened. He didn't draw back. He hastened and ran toward the enemy to meet the Philistine. He was ready. And David put his hand in his bag, and he took thence a stone. Beloved, I hope you know what your rock is, and I hope you know what your stone is. And he slang it, and he smote the Philistine in the forehead. There's that deadly wound to the head. And the stone sank into the forehead, and he fell upon his face uh, to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling stone, with a stone, and he smote the uh, Philistine, and he slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Uh, do you want to help with the wound? Then throw all that garbage out of your mind that is put out by most people and stick to the Word of God, for that's how it's going to be. There is a wounding. He overcame the bear. He overcame the lion with God's help. He accomplished it with this stone. This wasn't just a common stone. He picked it up from the, that brook, from the water, the living water. And that stone is brought out to you that have ears to hear very clearly in the book of Revelation. We're going to close with that. But I want to first cover this just a little bit. A wisp of the lad. That's what the elect are today. 7,000 are not a great number. Through Christ, we're going to bring down Goliath. It is using common sense, following God's word, standing against this false Christ, his lies, and slinging 
the truth at him, the stone that is the real truth. Let me document this for you from the book of Revelation, chapter 2. One verse, and that verse is verse 17. That's all it takes to document everything we've said when you have ears to hear. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. That means the hidden truth, the truth that other eyes have been blinded to. And will give him a white stone. Underline it, beloved. I said a white stone. Now, do you want that stone that David slew Goliath with? Then know this stone. For it is the stone that you will use in the last days. And in the stone a new name written. Do you know what that new name is? It's the name of the truth. Uh, which no man knoweth, saving he that received it. Let me give you a little lesson in Greek. But you check me out on it yourself. You, you prove it for yourself. If you were to look in a Strong's Concordance, you would find that this word stone is 5586. That it means a pebble worn smooth used for counting over a long period of time. This whole thing should be blending in the minds of all of you by this time, for this word was only used here in the entire word of God, nowhere else. And also, in the 13th chapter concerning that old beast and his mark, there is a word that is used, it is called count to the number of the beast. Do you know what that word count and the method was? It's the same word, or from the root of it, to use pebbles or stones to enumerate and count and number the beast over a long period of time. It's the same stone, beloved. It's the stone that you must have in your sling. It is the truth. God's word is a miracle. As it flows from the old to the new, from the first bear to the last bear, from the first lion to the last lion, from the first stone to the last stone, perfect for every generation, the wounding to the beast must be accomplished. But you must do it God's way. There is no other. Who would want to do it any other way anyway? You know some fast-talking dude gets up and he, usually what he's interested in doing is lining his own pocket anyway. That's why they usually want to get 20 million or 10,000 or whatever together. All right? I mean, they're there wondering how much is in this for us. Well, we can make a name for ourselves and maybe help our people and be heroes. Okay. Give God the credit. Because he's the one that's going to do it. If he uses you, then you fall on your knees and thank him that he would even take the time out to say hi to you or answer a prayer. You serve him. It's written in his word. You've heard me say it over and over. It is written. Unfortunately, sometimes we're a little slow bringing the full truth from that word to completely understand it. But, beloved, there is a battle coming soon. I hope uh, that you have that stone in your sling stone, that stone that is the truth, that is a new name. I'm going to give you a little clue. When God returns, he's renaming. He's going to call the land Beulah, which means married. Do you want to take part in that marriage? Do you want to become married already? You, you know, to be a wife to him already in this generation, think about it. I speak in a spiritual sense. I thank him for David. If there was ever a man in Israel, it was that one, that lad. Let's see. And you might always remember, was David up front? No, David was passed over. His brothers were taken. Poor old David was left way out in the field, tending sheep. Well, it's a lot better to be tending the father's sheep than it is in a lot of the armies they've got trying to overtake a giant that they're running from. Thank God that he has made you a shepherd. Let us pray. Heavenly Father. We thank you, Father, for your truth. We thank you, Father, for the way. And that way is the way of life, the way of everlasting life, the way of eternity, the way of happiness, Father, the way to all these things. Thank you, Father, for blessing us with thy presence. 
We thank you, Father, for David, the example that he set, that lifts the hearts, Father, of we, gives us strength and causes each one of us to be proud of that lad and be a little braver in our own hearts. We thank you for this. In the precious name of Yahshua, Jesus Christ. Amen.